Okay, can nice. You see, can you see yeah, my screen? Yeah, you see. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a, a historic talk, if you want, a, a, a contribution to very recent history and physics and very specific, oops, okay. Very specific about the history of lattice field theory, but uh, to the best of my knowledge is something that hasn't been done before. So also thank you for the kind invitation in particular to Vitaly Bonyakov to give this talk and I regret that I cannot be in Protvino myself. Um, so the concepts, the, uh, the, fund the fundamental concepts of lattice field theory were elaborated already in the 70s and 80s and the key player here, there is no doubt about it, was Ken Wilson. However, let me mention also the work by Jan Smith, who was a PhD student at that time, but uh, he had notes of very similar concepts, but his advisor told him it is nonsense, so it remained unpublished at the time. And uh, there has also been independent activity in the Soviet Union at that time. Polyakov summarized this in, a, in an article, A View from the Island, which he wrote in 92, and he gives a lot of emphasis of the early work of Beretzinski. Now, these were then individuals working on that in the 70s and 80s, but since the 1990s, the lattice physicists uh, form a really international intercontinental community. Now they have a uh, order thousand, probably a bit more members, hard to count because they're also part-time lattice people. Um, and there is a quite unique um, annual lattice conference. It evolved from a workshop of about 200 people. And then nowadays it has about 500 participants a year, took place every year since the 1990s, only in 2020, it was canceled due to the pandemics. In 2021, it was for the first time online before it was always completely <laughs> presential. And now uh, exactly this year, we had the first time a hybrid event. So which is a good thing. OK, it was in Chicago. Not everybody can travel there and people have also visa restrictions. So that makes uh, it gives a lot of access to people to participate from around the world. Usually, lattice simulations are considered as a branch of theoretical physics. This is also my point of view. But one sometimes hears an, uh, a different point of view. For instance, Binder expresses this in his book that I can also consider this a third line of research in addition to theory and experiment, something in between because we kind of perform uh, numerical experiments and then we deal with statistical and systematic errors. So it has something in common. So that's a different point of view. So far there exist five lattice uh, textbooks. Okay, in other textbooks, lattice is mentioned, but five per textbooks which are entirely devoted to the subject. Now, a little bit very briefly, a uh, comment about the methodology. Uh, of course, we refer to the functional integral formulation of quantum field theory. And then the lattice in space time is an ultraviolet regularization because we truncate the very short distances or high momenta. And then it is important for us to move to Euclidean space. Uh, Euclidean space time, because this gives then a direct link to statistical mechanics. Um, okay, so we have, let's say, some field. I call the field configuration symbolically. It is phi here. So uh, probability of a specific configuration would be proportional to this exponential. It's just a minus here because it's Euclidean. We get rid of the imaginary uh, factor here. And once we have this relation, we say, OK, we use Monte Carlo simulations to generate a lot of configurations, which are random, but uh, which follow this probability distribution. And if we have done that, we can actually approximate the functional integral, which actually has an infinite number of distribution. But then we can measure basically any observable of interest, typically an endpoint function. And this is fully non-perturbative. So at any point, we leave the all the interaction terms in the exponent. Um, gauge invariance is implemented directly at the regularized level. So, and it is also very profitable to use compact link variables. So they are on the gauge group, not in the algebra. Um, this is something that we can do on the lattice. It cannot be done in the continuum. And in particular, this has the great benefit to avoid the necessity of gauge fixing. 
bottleneck in the simulations, in particular of QCD, is then the fermion determinant. Of course, fermions are given in principle by Grassmann fields, but in all theories of interest, we can write uh, we can write the Lagrangian in a bilinear form in the fermions field, so we can integrate them out, and we are left with the fermion determinant. And um, so we don't need to deal with Grassmann variables really, but we have to compute this determinant frequently in every update step. So and, and this has typically millions of components. So this is really what slows down the simulation. And um, okay, if you update the link variable, you can, can, can compute the change in the action locally, but not the impact on the fermion determinant. So that's why this costs about two orders of magnitude more computing time. And that's why in the 20th century, um, simulations were often done quenched, which means that the determinant was simply put to one, as if um, uh, uh, as if uh, dynamical, uh, as, as if quarks were statics and, and, and there were, were not PC quarks. And so this brings in a systematic error, which is hard to estimate, but just by comparison with um, with phenomenology, with experimental data, it is, was not so bad. It approximates QCT to about 15%. But now we are in the 21st century. Uh, quarks now are simulated dynamically, everything taken into account. And I show you this uh, as an example of uh, 2010 of our QCTSF collaboration, which involves Mexico and Russia, so myself and Vitaly. So this is the spectrum of light, uh, light hadrons. The pion and the kion are used as an input to tune the, the bare masses of the light uh, U and D quarks and the S quark respectively. And then all the rest can be counted as results. The black bars are the experimental values and the red symbols are our uh, lattice results with the, with the errors. And we see that we have a beautiful agreement. So nobody can say that all this is by accident. So now we have really conclusive results, in particular about the light hadron spectrum. And this is despite Wilson's pessimism. So uh, this was also before my time, but people told me about it. Uh, in 89, he appeared for, for the last time at the Lattice Conference. And although he was the great pioneer of this field, he suddenly was very pessimistic and said, this is all nonsense. It will take forever until you get to any useful result. And then he swift, he left the field and uh, moved to light conquantization, which actually didn't lead to very much, at least not in four dimensions. But the community kept working on it. And uh, now we have, OK, it took some time. He has reason that's not completely wrong. But now, OK, some 20 years later, we had then uh, very precise percent level results for, uh, let's say, the Hartran spectrum, many other quantities, matrix elements, uh, the um, phase trans that uh, crossover between uh, heteronic phase and quark gluon plasma and so on. And thus we actually explain about 98% of the mass of any macroscope object. So we know that um, if we have a macroscopic object, uh, the mass is basically the mass of the nucleons inside. And for them, the Higgs mechanism is quite irrelevant. It provides the masses of the U and D quark, which make one or two percent of that mass, and all the rest is actually gluon energy. And which was uh, in the twentieth century, many people considered this impossible to calculate ever. But now we have the result for this ninety-eight percent of the mass. And there are still a lot of open questions. For instance, uh, excited states for the Roper resonance and excited states of the nucleon. There we still get results which are too high. We're working on that. Typically, lattice spacings are between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 Fermi. And um, OK, this is still the main source of systematic errors that we have. And we can say, OK, with more computing time, we just make it finer. It's not as simple as that. If you make it finer, um, OK, the QCD has topological sectors, then it becomes more continuum-like. And uh, we, we produce a Markov chain of configuration, which is then uh, frozen into one topological sector, so we are not probing uh, the, the space of configurations properly anymore. So here we have, uh, we have also conceptual problems to be addressed. It's not just about computing. And uh, still in the 21st century, we made a step from post-dictions that say, of course, nuclear mass was known before, but we just showed that really emerges from QCD, but also to predictions. Here's was maybe the historic first example uh, collaboration at Fermilab, uh, Lattice collaboration predicted the mass of this heavy 
heavy meson in 2005, and just one year later, it was measured in beautiful agreement with this uh, lattice calculation. However, the agreement was that I should talk here about the historic evolution. Uh, so I will, the rest of the talk will not be devoted to physics anymore, but to statistical data about the historic evolution. This was the agreement of the invitation. Maybe at another occasion, I will be more, most, more than happy to talk more about physics itself. So um, in 1991 and 92, the online preprint repository archive uh, was established, became operational. 91, so first steps and sporadic entries, and since 92, it really works. And this was just around the time when also the Lattice community was formed and established. Uh, conceptual bases were there, and at this, and this is probably uh, the the reason for the time was that uh, now computing facilities became widely accessible. Now, before it was a kind of very limited access and very difficult, and then uh, from that time it was widely accessible. So that was the moment to establish really the community, and so um, and this archive had then a very specific section, um, the head plot, which is devoted to lattice results. And this gave me a quite a unique opportunity to monitor the statistic evolution over three decades. Uh, particularly also, it is used very systematically by lattice people. All pre -pre lattice preprints are sent there. And uh, this is not true for, for other communities. So here in this regard, it is really a, a unique opportunity to, to reproduce the statistics of the lattice activity. So what I... Captured are, first of all, all the entries which went into uh, the head plot, so as a primary archive. So I do not capture cross listings because usually they're not really lattice works. And then I could also uh, measure or uh, take the data for the subset of uh, papers of regular, of uh, these were first preprints, preprints which later turn into regular papers that does not include proceeding contributions, for instance. And then I could also capture all the citations to these entries. And I could also measure here the, the Hirsch index H. So you know that um, if, uh, if the Hirsch index is H, that means there are at least uh, H entries which are, which are quoted at least H times. And um, to put it into a broader context, I compared this then to, uh, to the sum over seven related archive sections, had pH, phenology, theory, uh, HEPLAT is included, uh, gravitation and quant uh, quantum cosmology, nuclear physics, quantum physics, and condensed matter summed over all the subsections. And uh, as a quality parameter, then I consider this linear combination here. So the entries plus the publication. So if it is published regularly, it counts uh, twice, plus uh, the citations divided by 20. So these this, um, uh, coefficients were based on statistical trends, as we will see. Um, I take global statistics and also national statistics. I consider this extensively, that means the whole absolute numbers, and also intensively, so that means national statistics compared to the population, also to uh, cross uh, domestic product and so on. So we will see that I compare it also to three socioeconomic um, parameters, the cross domestic product or the cross domestic product per person or per capita, and then I also considered the education index. So education index definition has changed a number of times. So the latest definition is that one takes the combination of the expected schooling years um, and, uh, for, for, uh, for children and the mean schooling years uh, projected by 2015. So it is essentially based on schooling years normalized such, okay, 18 would be the, matter, the, the years getting to a master degree but in no country, all people get a master degree. So um, if you take this number, so all, all countries are between zero and one. And of course, this is intrinsic. It does not, it does not depend on the, on the population of a country. And the source of this were United Nations Development Program. I also considered first the Human Development Index, but I will not present it here because it turned out that it is in all cases very similar to the Education Index. Human Development Index also takes uh, into account health, uh, life expectancy, income, um, and, um, and education, but uh, okay, then also considered 
skills, uh, skilled labor force, but uh, okay, unfortunately the data that I got here are a bit messy, so I cannot really use that. And um, regarding the national statistics should say an article counts for a country if at least one author has his working address there. So I do not ca care and I do not know what, uh, what, what where this author was born and what is his nationality. I just capture what is his working address on this article. And that means, of course, an article can count for several countries. And um, of course, um, if it would be huge collaborations like we had at, uh, <laughs> at uh, LHC and so on, then it would be all washed out. But uh, OK, here in the lattice, we have typically relatively small collaborations, then maybe 20 persons. So the data were taken in summer 2020 from the old version of the Inspire, which was very useful for that purpose. So that for some time there were two versions on the in the net, and um, and that, that it already told that they would switch this off. So I was in a rush to take the data from there in the last moment because uh, the new version is completely useless regarding the statistics. For instance, if I specify the date, then it gives me multiple entry when it was submitted, when it was replaced, when it was published, and so on. And theoretically, one can avoid this with date earliest, but this gives results which are obviously wrong. For instance, it said, told me that in 2019, there is only one Heplot entry, so this doesn't work at all. And also the function country code which uh, the old version had was unfortunately switched off. I communicated with the people and the administrators and tried to convince them to reinstall it, but this hasn't happened. So the, the old version is much more useful than the, was much more useful than the new version. It's a pity that they changed it. Now, this is the evolution of the Heplot entries that we have over, over this period over three decades. Here you see the entries in the beginning. There is a slope up when the community was still growing. Uh, since around 98, there's actually this quite stable up to fluctuations, as you can see. And uh, you can also see that about half, a little bit less than half of the these entries get later published as regular papers. And these are the citations, also growing initially, then stable. And then there is a dip at the end, but this has a trivial explanation because, okay, I... I measured the, the citations up to the year 2020, so on, that then the latest latest entries had less time to be published, so this, this doesn't really mean very much. Now, uh, let me compare this to, to uh, this uh, six other um, archive sections. We see head pH is the most productive one here. These are the entries and dashed with the same color, you see the publications. It has a clear growth, um, Every, uh, since since the 90s, and also HEPTH is number two. And you see, for instance, this quality section, you have a slope up, up to now. So this was continuously growing. HEP lot was actually since 98, we said, we mentioned already, saturated uh, more or less in stagnation. These are the citations, again, growing in the beginning, then stagnating, and this dip at the end is simply because the centuries had less time to be quoted by 2020. And um, okay, um, we have here then the total numbers. We see that um, this is ordered uh, hierarchy. So uh, HEP, HEP PH is the most active one, uh, also in terms of publications and, and citations. Then HEP TH, gravity, nuclear theory, condensed matter. Of course, there's a lot of activity in condensed matter, but in that community, it is not completely standard to, to send the uh, the preprints to the archive. Maybe they are afraid that uh, some, somebody could steal their results because they are because before they are published and they really have the, the, the right on them and so on. So uh, so that's uh, that doesn't reflect all the activity in this community. Uh, then comes HEP lot, a smaller section, and finally quant is the smallest one. Now, if you compare it with the published papers, you see that actually Quantfus is winning. So we have, I took here the ratio of the two and typically in most other sections, 70 or 80% of the preprints get published as regular papers. In the Heplot, it's less than a half. And this is probably because of the particular role of the lattice conferences. This is annual. It has, uh, it's a snapshot of the activity of the communities. Every student, every participant can give at least a parallel talk or a poster and write a proceeding contribution. And all this, a lot of works get, gets actually only published in this proceeding contribution. So there are relatively few regular articles. 
the citations in this community are fine. They are they are both with other sections here, but below head pH and head QH. So on average, about twenty six citations for an article. So this is now the evolution um, with respect to different countries. Here we have the entries, um, and we see that uh, USA was dominating in the beginning and is also dominating if we sum over this period. But if you look at the time evolution, you see that around uh, 2010, Germany actually caught up with the USA. And ever since, they are in equilibrium here. So. Before it happened, to, it, it, uh, it was the rule that every second year the lattice conferences in the USA. If you look at the statistics, this is actually exaggerated. Already, Germany alone produces as much uh, lattice results as the USA. Then we have uh, Japan following. This is just producing entries. Yeah, the Japan following United Kingdom, Italy, France, and here we have then uh, rank uh, seven to twelve. Spain, Austria, Russia, here is a uh, number, uh, what is it, 10 in this regard. And uh, Switzerland, uh, here I excluded preprints from CERN. That would be cheating. So Switzerland without CERN, here is a, um, number 11. Oh, no, sorry, Russian is 9. And then China, you see here, started off at practically zero in the beginning and now is moving up recently. So China is getting into business. And of course, the countries which do not produce that much, they have strong temporal fluctuations as we see here from Spain and from Austria. And uh, this is the table uh, of the extensive statistics and uh, it is ordered according to the Hirsch index for the, uh, for the entire nations, for all countries which have Hirsch index above eight. And you could also order it with uh, respect to this uh, linear combination that I presented before. And actually, the ordering changes very little. In most cases, it is the same. So here, France and Italy switch positions, but it uh, make, uh, shows that this combination is reasonable. Um, OK, we refer to, to nations, but I also include the European Union here, just for comparison, with 28 nations. And at that time, it still included the United Kingdom. And again, in Switzerland, the uh, um, case of Switzerland, CERN is not included. I also display here the population in millions of inhabitants and the gross domestic products in 10 to the 9 US dollars and purchasing in parity. Just as a reference, uh, we see here that, uh, oops, sorry, ah, sorry. Uh. So uh, USA is dominating. Germany is close to it. We saw that it's, it's actually caught up. Then we have United Kingdom, Japan, Japan, France, Italy, Switzerland, seven, amazing for a small country, Spain, Austria, Australia, Hungary, Cyprus, also even more amazing for a small country. We will later see this with the intensive data and Austria. And here it follows China getting uh, to position 13, Russia at position 15 here. I don't go through all the details. It will be posted on the on the web page. So if you're partic particularly interested in one or the other countries, you can consult it and compare it later. Just mention maybe Latin America, uh, Brazil is active. And uh, for some time, there's a group in Sao Paulo and Mexico. This is essentially my, my small group here in Mexico trying to contribute to lattice physics. And um, now, if we sum it over these seven archive sections, um, so this gives a much broader statistics, not only in lattice physics, uh, USA is still dominating, European Union is close to it, it's actually not, uh, not exactly um, catching up with the USA. Then we have France in second position, taking over Germany. Fr Germany is more active in lattice, but France more in other fields, have pH, have TH, and so on, United Kingdom. CERN, if it would be a country, it would, if it were a country, it would be right on top here. We have Italy, Spain, Russia here is doing much better. If you sum over these uh, seven sections, it's, um, it's uh, position seven, Canada, Japan, Switzerland, and so on. China, curiously, is again a position 13. Brazil is doing quite well here. And um, okay, so here, th this is how it goes on. Mexico down here, position 13. And um, okay, if we take again the e, the rank of this sigma is is it is in general similar to the ranks that we have here for the 
age index. Okay, so you can compare the numbers here, 2022 and so on. So there are minor fluctuations. And to be fair, I should say, if I would take the Sigma rank as a criterion, then Turkey, Romania uh, would enter the top 40 that I, I have here. But now the statistics was based on this Hirsch index. Now let me proceed to the intensive statistics. So this is a scatter, these are scatter plots. Uh, there are 66 nations who contributed to the lat lat head plot, so who have generated any lattice results at all, about a third of the nations in the world. And um, if I divide this by the population in millions, this is what, what gives this uh, little sigma here. And here I compare it to the gross domestic product per person. So this is uh, lattice production versus economic wealth. And um, one could expect that this is, um, this is a narrow uh, increasing line. It is actually not, it is quite much spread over. Of course, there is a trend of increasing. Uh, more wealthy countries produce more, but uh, it is spread quite a lot. This, uh, this is a lock lock plot, as you see. So then uh, countries which stick out, which produce a lot of lattice papers compared to their economic potential are particular Cyprus, Hungary, and Georgia. As you see, they are above this diagonal here. And uh, okay, below I do not mention because there are many countries which have not any production at all, so that will not be fair. But um, then which are also productive compared to the economic potential of Slovenia, Slovakia, Albania, and Armenia. And if we now compare it instead to the education index, you see again Cyprus sticking out, and then also countries like India, Yemen, Bangladesh, they are relatively active compared to their uh, educational level. And then there are other countries like Argentina, Kazakhstan, um, who have a much higher educational level, but you do not produce lattice results. So I'm not saying if this is good or bad, I'm just saying they have other priorities. Now, if you do the same for the seven archive sections, now a much larger sum, we have a sort of a more focused diagonal here. So the, the, the correlation between uh, economic wealth and, and um, uh, physics, physics uh, production is, is, a bit, uh, is a bit stronger. And also here with the with the educational index, um, okay. The, uh, I marked here just the countries which stick out of the diagonal, or the rest can in principle by, be identified from the tables which I attach. And uh, we see we have high um, production in physics compared to the economy for Armenia, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Benin, and the low one, for instance, for Brunei, Luxembourg, Kuwait. United Arab Emirates, Quattro, Saudi Arabia. So these countries are wealthy, but produce rather little physics um, physics uh, uh, papers. And um, if you compare it to the educational index, then for instance, Portugal, Benin, Morocco, India, Pakistan, produce a lot of uh, physics papers compared to, uh, with uh, respect to their educational level. And on the other hand, New Zealand, Lithuania, Latvia, Sri Lanka, Philippines, have a good broad education uh, compared to the relatively low physics output. Now, this is then the, the table for, for the intensive statistics for the head plot. And here, Cyprus is winning. Cyprus are a small country, but they have a very dedicated lattice collaboration. So that puts them intrinsically on the rank one, followed by Switzerland, Ireland, Denmark, Germany, so, okay, some countries like Germany are again in the top uh, few, but then there are quite, or, or also United Kingdom, but there are significant changes. We see that Cyprus jumping to the top. The United States, for instance, here is only at position 15 uh, before dominating, but intrinsically not. European Union is very similar. Also, Japan is not doing so well anymore. And if we continue, then we get down to, uh, for instance, Russia is intrinsically divided by population around a position 30. And so this is, these are then the further details about it. And um, if you do the same again for the seven archive sections, then um, uh, the special role of Cyprus is gone. It moves down to uh, position 15 because, okay, it has a lattice group, but that doesn't mean that it is active in, in a lot of branches of, of physics. And then Switzerland is winning with this regard, with regard to population before in front of Israel, Germany, Sweden, France, uh, Denmark, Belgium, United Kingdom, Finland, Italy. So this changes quite a bit. For instance, the United States, even some though with a seven 
uh, sections is not uh, it's only a position 20 just between Iceland and Ireland. So if we take it relative to the population, it's not dominating anymore. And uh, let me see where is Russia here at position 34. At, um, now uh, we can also take this relative to the economic production. So if we take it, if we divide it by the gross domestic product per person, then this changes a lot because then for instance, um, Armenia would be number one, Georgia number three. So these countries, uh, they have sort of certain population that's not so small, but uh, compared to their economic gross domestic product, they uh, they have a lot of physics product physics uh, results, and so they, so these countries would then suddenly dominate. I should mention here that I have excluded tiny countries of less than fifty thousand inhabitants. This affects in particular Monaco and the Vatican. They generate a couple of, uh, of uh, <laughs> physics papers, and if we divide it by the population, then they would have a tremendous output. But it doesn't make sense to include them in the statistics. And then again, uh, strong countries respect to the economy would be Georgia, Armenia, Estonia. They move uh, drastically up. On the other hand, Norway, Austria, Australia, Netherlands, they move down. So if you measure them with the economy instead of the population. And um, uh, so these are the first 35. I should mention if you take this economic rank instead of the sigma here, then Bulgaria, Benin, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine uh, would, would also enter the top 35. So that uh, takes me already to the summary and the review of the highlights. We have analyzed the Heplot statistics uh, over three decades and also compared them to several other archives where also always refer to the primary section. So this is must be the primary archive where something, an article is submitted, not counting cross listings. On average, there are 10 or five uh, entries in the HEPLOT per week, so about two a day. And um, okay, there is a stagnation since around 1998, not growing anymore. And uh, in average, they are to have uh, published, they are cited about 26 times, which is below HEPPH and HEPTH, but above other archive sections. What is peculiar is that only 46% get published as regular papers. I mentioned that this is the probably the special role of the annual lattice conferences. So we write a lot of proceedings and not so many regular papers as in other branches of physics. Um, there are 66 countries which contribute to lattice physics at all out of 195 countries in the world. So about one out of three. And um, if you look at the extensive, so the total national statistics, then the top 10 based on the Hirsch index are United States, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, France, Italy, Switzerland, without CERN, Spain, Australia, Hungary, and China would then be at uh, rank 13, moving up and Russia at uh, position 15. And as I mentioned, since two, this is summed over the whole period, but since 2010, actually Germany has caught up with the USA in lattice physics. Now, if we sum over the seven archive sections, then the dominance is the USA, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, Spain, Russia, uh, Canada, Japan, and Switzerland. China here, position 13. Now, if we move to the intensive statistics, so relative to the population, in the Heplot, uh, Cyprus is winning over Switzerland, Ireland, Denmark, Germany, Austria, Hungary, United Kingdom, and Slovenia. Uh, and Finland get into this top 10. United States is only at position 15 and Russia at position 30. If we sum up over the seven archive sections, which are more or less related, then we have Switzerland, Israel, Germany, Sweden, France. So these are a bit different number, uh, countries, Denmark, Belgium, United Kingdom, Finland, and Italy. USA is only at position 30 and uh, Russia at uh, 20, excuse me, and Russia 34. And um, if you now compare the best uh, performance in the HEPLOT with respect to the economy, to the gross domestic product per person, we have again Cyprus winning before Hungary and Georgia. And if you compare it to the uh, education index, we have Cyprus. India, Yemen, that means, okay, these countries have the education index relatively low compared to the high lattice activity. And if you compare it now over the seven archives, we have uh, 
Armenia, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Berlin doing particularly well in physics compared to the economic power that they have. And uh, if you compare it to the educational index, then Portugal, Benin, Morocco, India, Pakistan are not particularly doing well, or you can um, are doing well um, compared to the to the level of education beyond physics in general. So that is it. Thank you very much. Well, well, well. Questions? Vitaly? Hello, Volgan. Yes, hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for interesting presentation. And I'm curious about you. Uh, are you keeping with uh, still with the uh, latest uh, QCD? And if yes, and in which direction? <laughs> I'm still working in lattice simulations. Uh, not doing particularly QCD. Okay, as you know, this is a matter of large collaborations with access to uh, supercomputers in many places and so on. So uh, not doing that anymore. I have now my collaboration, my small collaboration here in Mexico. So five, six students are uh, for the moment also one postdoc involved and we have access to a local cluster. So um, the direct, so we are doing lattice simulations, lattice field theory, but not particularly lattice QCD where we cannot compete. But uh, we look more for conceptual projects. Uh, whenever topology enters, the question is entirely non perturbative and also um, more, either models like toy, uh, uh, Schwinger model and so on, or, or spin models with applications maybe in uh, solid state physics or just of conceptual interest and so on. So, so we are doing still simulations. So recently we started to do simulations out of, equi out of thermal equilibrium which is mm. actually interesting. This is part of the real world. <laughs> both relevant for the early universe and for also for experimental data, but uh, it is little done in the lattice community and it is doable with relatively small computing power. So, so we're looking for this kind of, uh, of projects, but we're still doing lattice, but not, not particularly lattice QCD. That's okay, thank you. More questions?